We're always trying to find the mass. Now, uh, this is a famous quote from Isaac Newton. says, I can calculate the motion of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. So let's take a look at what we're... Uh, Newton, what Newton has in store for us. The first thing is the learning goals. Now, you should be able to describe the Newton's laws of motion. There are three of them that we're going to look at today. So you should be able to understand the three laws of motion. You should be able to distinguish between mass and weight, and that's a big one. For some reason, people get those two terms confused quite a bit because they're used commonly, uh, usually interchangeably in common vernacular. So make sure that you can distinguish between those two terms. And you should also be able to use the equation F net equals MA. So, let's take a look at what we've got. First things first is the balloon rocket. So whenever you were doing your engage activity, or if you were to let go of a balloon, what you would see is that a balloon would go forward as air escapes it. So what you would see is you would see air escape the balloon, and whenever the air escapes the balloon, what you see is that the, or the balloon is propelled forward. And the question is, is, what is the force that is making the balloon go? So we'll take a look at it. It says, whenever you were doing the balloon rocket it continued to move even when it was completely out of air so the balloon would let all of its air out it would be perfectly deflated and yet it would still continue to move along its path and so the question is, is why is that the case so let's take a look at some possible explanations and the first one was Aristotle now Aristotle was a very smart guy in terms of philosophy he was one of the first scientists that we had that set up scientific theory but he had some very, very incorrect theories with regards to motion. You see this circle with the X through it. It is an incorrect theory, but you still need to know about it. So what Aristotle said is that objects will seek their natural place. So in other words, if you take a rock and the rock is in the air, the rock's natural place is on the ground. So it will seek its natural place, and that's what's called natural motion. Now, since a rock's natural place is on the ground, whenever you pick up a rock, what you were doing is you were exerting something called violent motion. And what he said is that the speed of an object is directly proportional to the force that is exerted on it. So if you take a ball and you push that, or a rock, and you push that rock, the faster you push that, or the more force you exert on that rock, then the faster the rock will go. And so this was Aristotle's idea of motion. Now, it sounds good in theory. Yeah, the more I push a rock, the faster it goes. But it is incorrect. Okay. Now think about it. If you were to roll a ball, once you let go of the ball, what forces are acting on the object? People say, well, I threw it. And I say, yes, you did exert a force on it, but once you let go, there's no more forces that are acting on the ball, yet the ball continues to move this way. So that was kind of a, a hole in Aristotle's motion or ideas on motion. So we come to Newton. Newton is, this class is called Newtonian Mechanics for the first Everything that you learn in this class, for the most part, is some way tied to Newton. He is famous for saying, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. But he made significant contributions to almost all fields of physics, including optics, laws of motion, gravity, calculus, and fluid mechanics. Him with a German called, named Leibniz invented calculus roughly at the same time. Okay, So he was very, very, very smart. And what he did is he came up with these laws of motion that we're going to talk about. And the first one is the law of inertia. Now, there are two parts to the law of inertia. And the first one is that objects are lazy. An object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a net external force. So if you take a ball and you put that ball on the ground, it will stay there forever until something makes it move. Now, it could be somebody comes up and kicks the ball. Well, that's a force that's exerted on it. Somebody says somebody could come pick the ball up. Well, that's a force that makes it move. Somebody could tilt the floor, which would cause the net external force to occur, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But no matter what you do, there's always going to be a force that's exerted in order to make the object move. So objects like to be lazy. They like to be at rest when they're at rest. The second part of the law it's kind of this along the same lines as objects don't change. If this ball is moving along the floor, that ball will continue to move in that same motion unless an outside force acts on it. Think about it this way. If you roll a bowling ball down a bowling alley, it will continue to go forever until it hits the pins or it hits the back wall. And people say, well, this isn't entirely true. I can take a, a, a golf ball and I can roll it in the grass and it comes to a stop. Yes, you can, 
because there is a net external force on the object. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but the reason why the ball will come to a stop is because there's a frictional force. Okay, now if there is no friction, the ball will continue to move forever. And you see this kind of example usually with outer space questions. Because there's no friction in space, because there's no air, generally once you get an object on its path, it'll go there forever. So for example, uh, if I'm on Earth and I want to shoot something to the moon, it actually doesn't take as much fuel as you might think because once it leaves Earth's atmosphere, okay, it kind of goes on its own forever. So it's one of those things that is very useful to us in the space program. So what is a force? We've talked a lot about force. You should be familiar with the term from earlier grades, but basically a force is a push or a pull that can result in the change in an object's motion, direction, or shape. Now, the push or pull does not necessarily have to make it move. You can have forces that just, I mean, you can push a wall all day and you're exerting a force, but it doesn't move. Okay, so a force is measured with something called a Newton spring scale. Okay, and a lot of people get this confused with a regular scale, but this is a Newton spring scale. And what it does is it has a spring that's been calibrated to measure certain forces with certain lengths of the spring. And you can actually see this right here. So as you hook an object onto it, it pulls it down, or whenever you pull it to the side, it will elongate that spring, and then it'll give you a force reading. There are also digital force sensors, but those are less common than these at this point. Okay, mass. We've talked about mass. Mass is a measurement of inertia in the sense that whenever you have an object, inertia is its resistance to motion. The more mass an object has, the more it is going to resist a change in motion. Uh, you have mass, it's usually measured with a balance. You usually ha either have a triple beam balance or what you have here is a digital balance. And then what you have is the balance will, should be measured in kilograms, whereas force is measured in the standard unit of the Newton. Okay, so the first example says NASA is investigating a round trip to Mars. Determine the initial mission assessment, the weight the car of the cargo provided. Explain why this information is uh, although useful is not as relevant as the mass and so the initial mission assessment says that here's the weight of the cargo and they could say something like um, a million pounds the problem with using weight which pounds is a term is a version of weight is that weight changes weight changes depending on where you are so because of that you can't use this term because this is a force and the force depends on other things the one thing that's a universal measure of the amount of stuff that you have is mass. And so you really need to report things in mass, not weight. So we want to look at the differences between uh, force and mass. Um, they can both be approximated as the amount of stuff. And I know that's kind of not scientific, but they're both measurements of that because as the mass goes up, the force generally goes up. And we're looking specifically at the gravitational force here. Okay, but other than that, they're very different values. Okay, mass is a scalar, which means it doesn't have to have a direction. Force is a vector, which means it has to have a direction. Um, mass is an, uh, it's an extrinsic property. Force is both an extrinsic property. So they both are independent of that. But force changes based on where you are. So it can change based on location. Mass is going to be the same everywhere as long as you don't change the the object that you're looking at. Really the only thing they have in common is that they're measurements of stuff and they're both in some equations. But you need to know the difference between these two because a lot of people get them mixed up and you can guarantee that you'll have a test question on the difference between the two. Now, example A3 says a rock is attached to a string and swung in a circle. What direction will the rock fly if the rope is suddenly cut? Now, we're going to talk more about circular motion a little bit later, but you may have seen this. If you kind of let go of something, um, the rock doesn't continue to go in a circular path. Instead, what it does is wherever, whatever direction it's going in, as soon as that rope is cut, there are no more forces acting on it. So the rock will actually fly in the, in the direction that it's going at that particular point. Okay, which object has a greater inertia? A car moving down the highway or a cruise ship at rest? Now, this is kind of a, an interesting use of the term inertia. Really, what it's asking for is which object has a greater resistance to motion. And it turns out that, remember, resistance to change in motion 
is the object with the greater mass. Now, even though the car is moving, okay, it does not resist change to motion nearly as much as the cruise ship. So you're looking for, this might as well say, which one has a greater mass? And when you do that, you would say clearly it's the cruise ship. Now, in the weight versus mass lab, we actually explored the relationship between force and mass. And we came up with a graph. And you had, um, you had force, and this was, it depends on how you did it, but this is generally mass, and this is generally force, depending on how you graphed it. And you found out that there was a specific relationship between these two variables. And that, that um, slope in this particular case gave you the value of acceleration. So it's one of those things that you need to be able to take a look at, and you need to be able to figure out the relationship between these variables like we did in the lab. So we can look at Newton's second law. Newton's second law is the one that has a formula in it. It says the force is proportionally, uh, is directly proportional to acceleration. So in other words, if you push something with twice as much force, you're going to get twice as much acceleration. And that's generally true. If you're stuck pushing a car by yourself, it's really hard to do. But if you have a friend who can come and help you, it's a lot easier with two people. So twice the force equals twice the acceleration. Half the force equals half the acceleration. And that's the first part of Newton's second law. The second part is that mass is inversely proportional to acceleration. So if you have a force and you exert it on a mass of m, you get an acceleration of a. But if you make it three times more massive without changing the force, now your acceleration is reduced to a third. So mass is inversely proportional to acceleration in the sense that as mass goes up, acceleration goes down. Now, Newton put all these together in what he called the second law formula. And this is a whole lot easier to understand. It says you have something called the net force. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the net force later. But for now, it's the total force. And then you have mass and acceleration. Now, we've talked a lot about acceleration already. Um, acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. It's measured in meters per second squared. Um, and it's measured with an accelerometer. Mass is the amount of matter. Okay, It can be measured with a triple beam or digital balance. And um, we've talked about those. So force is really what's new. Uh, force is a push or pull. We've talked about the definition. It is measured in the SI unit of the Newton. It is measured with a spring scale, or you can use something called a digital force sensor. And some, some actual scales are, are calibrated to, to Newtons as well. So we come to our first example. It says you have a 10 kilogram box that is accelerated using a force of F. So we're exerting the force of F, we're exerting a force of F. It says compare the acceleration of the two boxes. So we're using a force of F equals MA is what we're using. We want to compare the two accelerations. So we have a force that's the same. So since the force is the same between these two boxes, what I can do is instead of saying F equals MA and F equals MA, I can say M1A1 equals M2A2. And the reason why I can say that is F equals MA1, F equals MA2, set them equal to each other and they cancel each other out. So now I can plug in my numbers. I can say 10A1 equals 40A2. Now when we're trying to compare these values, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and get the variables on one side and the, and the uh, numbers on the other. So I'm going to divide both sides by 10. And I'm going to divide both sides by A2. And by doing that, I remove the 10 from this side and I remove A2 from this side. And what I'm left with is A1 over A2 is equal to 4. 40 divided by 10 is 4. What this is saying is saying A1 has four times the acceleration of A2. Because the only way this would work is if you had 4 over 1, or 8 over 2, or 12 over 3. But in each case, the acceleration of the first one is four times greater than that of the second one. Example B2 says determine the mass of an object when a 20 Newton force is applied. So we want to look at the 20 Newton force, and we say, okay, here's 20 Newtons. We have a force value of 20, and we have an acceleration value of 5. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, yeah, the relationship is the slope. A lot of times that is true, but you have to be very, very careful here. 
a lot of times it would be better for you to go ahead and take these values and plug them into the equation f equals ma. When you do that, you realize that it's actually going to be 20 equals um, m times 5, or m is 4. Whereas if you found the slope of this particular line, it would be 5 over 20, which is 1 over 4. Those are not the same things. So please be very careful when you say what the value of the slope is. You will have questions like this at some point. So be ready for them. Example B3 says you have a 1,000 kilogram car being towed with a chain capable of exerting 4,000 newtons without braking. What is, the what is the maximum acceleration of the car is capable of without breaking the chain? So, 1,000 kilograms, that's our mass. 4,000 newtons, that is our force. So we can use the formula F equals MA. We plug in our values, and when we do that, we get 4,000 equals 1,000 A. Divide both sides by 1,000, and when you do that, you get the acceleration is 4 meters per second squared. We go to example B4. It says an individual states they weigh 100 kilograms. Without a scale, explain how you know for a fact they do not. Okay, this is the, the types of questions you have to be ready for. Now, the term weigh, although we say weigh a lot, you weigh 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds, whatever it is, you have to realize that weight in pounds is one thing, but mass is measured in kilograms. So what they should say is says they have a mass of 100 kilograms. They can't use the term weight or weigh and 100 kilograms because those two things don't measure the same thing. What is the mass of a person uh, with a weight of 465 newtons? So you have right here a force, and the question says I'm looking for mass, but the key thing here is it looks like I'm missing the term acceleration. I want to use the formula F equals MA, but for some reason I can't because I don't have the acceleration. What you should realize is that whenever you're looking for the weight of an object, there is a special version of Newton's second law. It's the same formula, but what we do is we say FG, and what that does is that indicates the weight is equal to the mass, and then instead of A, we say G because that is the acceleration due to gravity. Now you do need to know this number. You need to memorize it. It is 9.81 and for most most purposes usually 9.8 your teacher may want you to use 10 instead. So just be aware of what they're supposed to use on, on the given problems. Talk to your teacher about what you're supposed to use. But we're going to use 9.8 here so this is a special, if these are the, t the same formula, F equals MA and F equals M FG equals MG, they're the same formula just for different context. Whenever you're looking for the weight of an object, if it's on Earth, you can use FG equals MG. So in our case here, we have 465 equals M times 9.8. When we divide both sides by 9.8, we get a force value of about, or excuse me, a mass value of about 47 point, about 4 kilograms. And that would be our mass value. So please make sure that you look at the situation and determine if the acceleration due to gravity would apply. Balloon rockets, what is the force uh, that pushes the balloon to the right? And it turns out that the force is exerted on the air escaping the balloon. And whenever the force is exerted on the air escaping the balloon, it turns out that there is an action-reaction force. So whenever, whenever you push one way, uh, you have to go ahead and account for the push the other way. Okay, so this is action reaction Jedi style. It says a Newton states his first law, his final law of motion says for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force acting on an object. And you can see that with this clip right here. As you see, there was a force exerted and an equal and opposite 
uh, reaction force exerted in the opposite kilogram dead with a force of 20 newtons on a frozen pond as shown below. So what you see is you see a force of 20 newtons in a frozen pond, we'll learn about later, make sure that there's no friction. So friction is gone. You don't know what friction is, so it makes it a lot easier at this point. But the boy exerts a force of 20 newtons on the man. So we can figure out what the acceleration of the man is relatively easily. We say a force equals mass times acceleration, or 20 equals 25A. Oh, excuse me, this is the man, so 100A. Divide both sides by 100, and when you do that, you get the acceleration is 0 0.2 meters per second squared. Now the boy is exerting the force to the left, so you can say that the acceleration is also to the left. That's the boy. Now if we were to take a look at the, at, excuse me, the man. Now let's take a look at the boy. Now whenever the boy exerts a force of 20 newtons on the man, the man exerts an equal and opposite force on the boy. Equal and opposite means it's 20 newtons to the right. So now what we can say is we can also use F equals MA for the force on the boy. We can say 20 equals 25A divide both sides by 25 and when you take 20 and divide by 25 <clears throat> you get 4 fifths or 0 0.8 0 0.8 meters per second squared now it's really important that you specify that his acceleration is to the right so they go in opposite directions and you see this if you've ever been on roller skates or ice skates and you push somebody they may go forward but you go backward So the next example says, a skydiver jumping out of a plane is pulled down by a force. What is the opposing force? Now this one is real tricky. Okay, So for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. A lot of people say, oh yeah, it's air resistance is the equal and opposite force. It's not. If air resistance were the equal and opposite force, the man would never go anywhere because the gravitational force would be down and then he would have an air resistance force that would be equal and opposite. Well, that means law of inertia applies, it cancels out, and there's no net force. The guy can't go anywhere. Since there's no forces on him, he would stay there. So it can't be that. And this is the tricky part for a lot of people. The gravitational force of the Earth pulling the man down, there is an equal and opposite force of the man pulling the Earth up. And so now the question is, whoa, whoa, wait a second. So whenever you jump from an airplane, you actually pull the earth up a little bit? The answer is yes, but at the same time, no. And the reason why is because although you do exert a force on the earth, trying to pull the force upward a little bit, the force that you exert on the, on the earth would be equal to your weight. So let's say you're really big and it's a thousand newtons. Okay, so if you're like 200 and, um, let's say 250 pounds or something like that. If you exert a thousand newtons of force on the Earth, it seems like, oh, well, I'm going to cause the Earth to accelerate. Well, remember that the mass of the Earth, when you apply Newton's second law, the mass of the Earth is 5980000000000000. Hold on, let me make sure I've got it right. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15. 0, 0, 0, 18, 0, 0, 0, 21, 0, 0, 0. So because the mass of the Earth is so large, it ends up having no effect on the Earth itself, even though you are exerting a force on it. So the next one, the last one says, a rocket is launched upward with a force of 100 newtons. What is the force exerted on the gas escaping the rocket? So if the rocket is launched forward with a force of 100 newtons, it's because the gas is ejected this way with a force of 100 newtons. Now that doesn't mean that each little particle of gas has 100 newtons. It means that the sum of all those has to be 100 newtons.